A very good evening to you. Thanks for joining us on the Friday edition of the show. I'm Yemi Adebaya from the city of Lagos right here in Nigeria. Of course, waiting in the wings to give you all you need to know uh, in the ever interesting, fast-paced, money-spinning world of sports. And that's what we do every day of the week. Thanks once again for joining us on the show. It's loaded today. We're going to be talking about things happening uh, in a lot of places. We're going to talk about the calf club competitions involving our teams. We'll talk about uh, the new era that begins at Manchester United. we we'll talk about it. We'll also go to Georgia and talk about uh, the exploits of Nigeria's uh, para power lifters uh, making us proud right there in Georgia. We'll do that on the show. As we go on, we'll continue the discussion on the biennial World Cup plans. Of course, some dissenting voices and also some other people offering a soft landing. We'll talk about all of that on the show tonight. Of course, I will not be alone. Of course, I will uh, of course, be joined by Austin later on. Uh, he will uh, be with us as we take this trip together. But for now, let me quickly introduce my partner in the Lagos studio, uh, Ikena Okechikwendu, makes a return <laughs> after how long? I don't know, but good to see you, Ikena. Thanks for so finding time to be here with me on the show tonight. Long time. I've missed the show. All right. to, be, to, to tell you the honest truth, I've missed the show. So it's a Friday. I'm here. It's a loaded Friday. We've had uh, sports all through the week. All through the week. So we are going into another bumper package this this weekend. All right. So we are here to dissect it all. Mm -hmm. That's that's what we're here to do: to dissect, inform, and educate as much as we can on the show. Uh, let's move on. Uh, what's our first spot of call tonight? Let's go to to Vilsi, uh, of course, and talk about the World Para uh, Championship, Para Powerlifting Championship, and uh, heartwarming news for uh, Nigeria yesterday. Uh, we, we're here talking about one athlete now. We're talking about another athlete. And today, uh, we're talking about Nigeria's Fola Shade Olua Femiayo. She stunned the sporting world today after setting a new record to win gold in the women's uh, up to 86 kilogram category. That's at the Para Power Lifting Championship in Georgia. Gold was already guaranteed for her after the second lift, because after the second lift, she was already she was already having an 11 kilogram lead. A third round lift of 148 kilograms secured uh, the gold uh, medal and her status as the world champion. But she didn't stop there. She didn't stop there. She went on to set a world, a new world record. And guess what? This is the fourth time this year she's breaking a record. And now for the fourth time in 2021, she breaks a record. Uh, she now sets in that category a world best of 152.5 kilogram. And that's the fourth record she has smashed this year. Uh, I mean, what else can we say about Nigeria's uh, para powerlifters, Paralympians? I mean, the incredible power of sports. I can go on and on. Very excited uh, to be talking about uh, this uh, athlete uh, tonight. Uh, smiles on everybody's faces. We'll get to see the pictures uh, later on. Uh, but Ikin, I'm always happy. Well, yeah, pictures on your screen. Let's, let's just allow our viewers to see the moment uh, when it all happened. <coughs> Um, I mean, you could hear, uh, amazing, amazing, that's the right word to use. You could hear the chairs, the claps. It, she has always been, it, it's not, it had, Even at second attempt, if she had decided she wasn't she, doing, she was, she she was, was going, guaranteed she, But I know she wanted to just up, up, up the game. Yes. Break under record, mm -hmm. win under Gomia. She's been doing it since, in World Championships since um, 2017. Mm -hmm. She's always been there. She won gold in the, in the last Olympics. Mm -hmm. So I just wish that... We could, this this particular, actually the powerlifter, they could have more funding. Mm -hmm. Let's take a piece of what we are pushing to football. Let's take a piece of what we are pushing to so other sports are pushing to power. Because they have been making this country proud. From 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 the, the onset, 
all the Olympics, they are the ones bringing on gold medals to the nation. They are, they are, with little or no preparation. No, little or no preparation. Yeah, some corporate yeah, individuals have, have, have been able to sponsor them for a while, but they can do with more funding. We can go around. We can go around the country to get more of this, of, of more flasher days in the east, in the east, in the north, in the, anywhere we can get them. Let them, let them have um, um, tournaments. Let them participate. Use funding to get them to come up stage. Because after she goes, we should have another person that will be able to replace her and break more records. Yeah. It's amazing watching her. I'm so proud for what she has done and what she has been doing for the Everybody sports. Is. Yeah. All right. That's it. Uh, Austin Okon Akpan um, is ready for us now. He joins us. Uh, we're taking this trip uh, together. I can see smiles on his face. I mean, I would smile too. And so, good evening to you, Austin. Uh, it's good to be on the show today. What a great thing to you hear me. And of course, our viewers, it's good to be on the show. What a story our power, our power, power lift has. What else can we say about these guys whenever they have an opportunity to represent the country? They just don't win. They break records. Yesterday, we're talking about Bossa Omolayo, and today is Folasha de Ulua Femiayo. Uh, who's also been consistent, if you remember, about three years ago at the World Championships, she broke her record, gave us some good dance with that, you know, and then she's, she's gone on to do the same thing now, breaking the world record. Again, I will say what I said yesterday. Um, this calls for more support for para power lifting, not just para power lifting in Nigeria, special sports because these persons you know they need special attention breaking our world record of 120 of 155 52 kg is a testament of the amount of work that these persons you know give to to the sport you know breaking borders you know not looking at their challenges most of them confined to wheelchairs yet unstoppable i keep telling you each time i talk about these guys they get me so emotional they inspire me you know, the motivators, they expose the power of sports to transform lives. Yeah, that's it. Um, uh, you know, yesterday we were talking about it. Uh, you know, I think it was Bolu that said, and uh, Iken has already entered uh, in that direction as well. The fear is that we've been blessed with this generation of um, mm. uh, para-athletes that we have. And the fear is... What happens after this generation if, if we don't do the path that you're talking about, if we don't mm. give the support, mm. if we don't... I mean, victory is sweet. We enjoy it. We all... I mean, success has many fathers, many friends, you know, like they say, and failures and often. Uh, if, if this lady didn't do this today, we probably would not be here talking about her. Now she has done it. Everybody wants to associate. Everybody wants to talk about what they did to help. Uh, but the real issue here is, uh, are, we, are we doing enough? Uh, for this group of athletes, and if we don't, it, will, will the conveyor belt continue to produce athletes? Because it appears like we're lucky with this generation. Yes, yeah, I mean, tough reality check you've just done, you know, and that's why I called on uh, the sporting authorities in Nigeria and everyone who, who cares about special sport that is time, because Yakubu Adeshoko has been competing forever. He's still competing. Lovely Nobiji is still competing. Lucy Ejike is still competing. And so it makes you worry that when are we going to start hearing about the new guys? Who's going to, you know, step up and, you know, do what we need to do to, you know, start discovering new athletes in power powerlifting, you know? And, and, I, and I think that's where this Ministry of Youth and Sports Development should work with the Nigeria Para, uh, para Sports Sporting Federation and see ways that they can, you know, start supporting these athletes and, and work towards, you know, not just discovering talents, but nurturing them and making sure that there's a right passage from this set of guys, because we've done everything right with para powerlifting. In fact, the International para Paralympic Committee, they want to study Nigeria. Uh, para powerlifters all over the world, they respect, you know, our athletes. And um, I don't know, because just about... Two weeks ago, there was a public outcry. We lost Paul Kende and, you know, the circumstances behind his death and, and, and how his barrier went. Some people didn't like it. That's, that's a, a world champion, an Olympic gold medalist. So for these guys who are still here, for his colleagues, we should start finding ways to take care of them and make sure that we equip them well enough to pass it on to the next generation. And you know, what you've done is a tough reality check. And I just hope there are persons in the Ministry of Youth and Sports Development, the NOC, the Nigeria Para uh, Sporting Federation, and everyone, including the media, because we need to support special sports. We need to sit up and start doing something to make sure that we do that transition.
Mm-hmm. Um, I was listening to a radio program just a few days ago. They are coach, female coach of the Paralympia. So when they went for a, um, a world championship and won so many, so many of, of, the, of the of the uh, distant the the, um, the medals. medals, the coaches, other coaches from the other countries called her and asked her, what special thing are they doing? And from what she explained, they weren't doing anything special. It's just sheer willpower of the determination. Ath- of determination of the athletes. I want us to take a cue of what's happening to female football. We are going to get there today. We were once a dominant force in Africa, but you can see that other African countries, especially South Africa, has caught up with us, mm-hmm. has even overtaken us. Mm-hmm. It will happen. At some point. At some point. It's how we are prepared for the oh. future, mm-hmm. how we are prepared and funding is the root of everything. If you are funding, if you are giving your the support, financial support to your to this to, the, to, to that sports, it will be able to yield fruits. They will be able to get other athletes. They will be able to discover other talents. So, it is basic. We should learn a lesson from what is happening. We are dancing and rejoicing for the record she has broken and the medal she has won. But we should sit down and plan for the future, which is basic. All right, we should sit down, plan for the future. Uh, a time will come, other countries will get lucky, other countries will do what we're doing, and we'll get better at it. So we have to be prepared that it will happen someday. Four or five years ago, it's, it was almost unthinkable to, to imagine that Nigeria would be struggling in women's football in Africa. Now it is happening, and of course it can happen across board. Hopefully that will not be the case. Let's talk about the ladies now, and uh, uh, of course there's a, lot, there's a lot of football on the show uh, tonight, but let's talk about the ladies as they prepare. The Falconets, that's it. Uh, they're going to, they have arrived in Brazzaville for a clash against Congo as uh, they be to qualify for the 2022 FIFA Under-20 Women's World Cup, and this is a crucial part of the qualifier. So they're there, according to uh, what the information the Nigerian yeah. Football Federation uh, put out, they're there. They're right. the, um, full complement of the squad uh, they want to use. If what they've done in times past is anything to go by, you could almost be forgiven if you think it's going to be a stroll in the park. But just like the real- reality check we're giving ourselves in, in para sports that we just talked about, we should also know that a day is coming. It won't be a stroll in the park and, and and this is age group uh, competition, so it's not the same people that played the last one. It's going to, so these are these are a new set of players, but at least they they showed their seriousness when they beat Central African Republic 11-1, um, 11-0 aggregate in the last qualifier. So I think I think um, this is a competition we've we've played final twice, so they are prepared from what from from what we have been reading online and everything. They are they are they are, they are, they are prepared to go go and it's the first leg. Which is which will give them an advantage. Playing the first leg away, at least you study your opponent, you know your opponent. When you come back home, you can finish the job. So so much hope from for the team. They have the from the um, players I saw they called up. I think we have hope in that in that aspect. All right, I think we do as well. We're still going to talk touch up on. We're talking about a FIFA competition. We're going to talk about uh, a FIFA plan um, for FIFA's plan for the Biennial World Cup. Some dissenting voices. Some. People already offering alternative ideas, but um, Austin, before uh, we, we we go to that place, because that's the next part of call, and of course you're going to give us your insights because you've been monitoring this. Uh, I mean, let's get your thoughts as well. Uh, my mine mine is that I feel this is going to be a stroll in the park, but I'm more worried about what happens after. Are you talking talking about the four corners, right? Yes, we're going to get to this, but a quick one on the four corners, yeah. then we'll go, we'll go to this. Yeah, you know, with, with, with the, with the under-20 women's team, we know the story. They've been to two, two World Cup finals, made the semifinals one time. Uh, it, again, with these ladies, the question of transition is also important. Uh, if you want to go by the results that they've gathered from these qualifiers, you, you, don't, you don't see Congo as any threat to, to the four corners, you know? They, they crushed Central Africa Republic in level zero on aggregate. Congo defeated Egypt 4 2 on aggregate. I know it's football where anything can happen, but at this developmental stage, you should be thinking about the future. You should be looking at talent and saying, can this take over the shoes of uh, Rashida, Tajibade, um, Assisa, Shola? Persons have complained that the Super Falcons have tired legs, have old players. This is where you fix it. This is where you solve that problem, the under-20 level. I believe they will beat Congo, you know, and then get into the ultimate round to 
to to compete for the proper qualifiers. So uh, let's just watch and see how it will go against Congo. And then the next round, uh -huh, I'll now sit upright as to see what we can do because then, you know, we it's the business stage of the qualifiers. But, but not, not pressure uh, as regards this on the 20 team and, and the qualifying third round clash against Congo. You're talking about the Bayern World Cup, so let's get right into that one now. A lot of mixed reactions here and there as regards uh, FIFA's plans to... You know, host the World Cup every two years. Remember when we spoke to Emmanuel Amamike? He came out playing and said, look, this will be very good for football in Africa. The Confederation of African Football also supporting it. You know, but federations still, you know, kind of divided about it. Europe, for instance, where I am, UEFA says, no, 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 no. This is so selfish. You're just thinking about money. You're not thinking about players. You're not thinking about the competition. Uh, so the vice president uh, of FIFA, uh, Victor uh, Montagiliani, is, is suggesting, you know, some sort of a compromise, you know, is offering it to say, look, guys, uh, at the end of the day, uh, let's see what can come out of this plan. Let's listen to him and move right back to talk about it. Um, actually, the principle, for instance, the principle of having an event in between the World Cups I'm totally for. Uh, the question is, what is that going to be? How do we look at it? Uh, how does that affect other things that are in the current ecosystem, like qualification processes, like current tournaments that are in there? I think that's the process that we need to go through. Now, whatever that thing is called and whatever size that is, again, you know, uh, you got to take into account what the calendar is going to look like, right? And how everything else meshes in there, right? Mm -hmm. um, and the rest period for the players and when the leagues start. So I think those are important elements. Uh, but I think those kind of discussions where you start thinking about those ideas, what this thing looks like, uh, could it be completely different than what a World Cup could be, for instance, a different format, um, which might be a, a good idea, right? Uh, formats that we've never thought about, for instance, uh, that would be exciting for fans. I think, you know, if you recall, we used to have something in between the World Cups. Uh, which was the old Confederation Cup. And although it wasn't, you know, a, a, a tournament that, you know, everybody was turned on to, but for some confederations, it was a nice link between your regional competition to, a, to an international competition. Um, and we lost that. Um, and, and I think the concept of having another competition, a national team competition, and, it, and if you recall, I think it was four or five years ago, we had already discussions of a global nations league. I don't know if you recall that, Simon. And so, 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 so these discussions are not foreign. That's a FIFA's vice president, Victor Montagliani, you know, bringing up some suggestions as regards uh, this biennial plans, this biennial uh, World Cup plans. He cannot let me get you to okay. He says, look, leave the main plan of having the World Cup every two years. Let's take a look at the qualifying process. <laughs> did, did you see sense in some of the points he raised? No. <laughs> no, because I'll I, I point out one thing. He was talking about Confederation Cup. Confederation Cup was not, um, it doesn't happen during the, um, the even years. It happened during the odd years, a year before the World Cup. So it doesn't say, because what we're talking about is having the World Cup every two years. You are going to disrupt a lot of things. The European Championship comes up at every even year, two years before the World Cup. And there is a long process of qualifying for the World Cup. I think this is driven by pure greed. That is my, that is my underlying, underlining point, is pure greed. And what I don't like, because I, I asked a question, I sent a, a question on, online, I asked, you have 54 members, 53 members in, in CAF. And all of them agreed. Everything that they said that day was all, everybody. Everybody voted with, the, with their green card. There's no dissenting voices. Nobody opposed. Nobody disagreed. It doesn't work that way. What is Infantino's interest in Africa? That's what I want to know. And what is on the table for us? And it is very disheartening for a competition like uh, like the African Champions League will be shelved for the World Cup the, the, to, to, to suit uh, Infantino and um, and Wenger's idea, ideas. So a competition that we have had that it was that was meant to develop the African game. Remember, we were, we were rejected. We never had a place in the World Cup up until 1970. That was when we had the first um, when, we, when they decided to give us a slot at the World Cup. Then we had two. So we have never been regarded. It was Havalanche that actually brought um, Africa to the table, gave us some incentives. 
gave us under 20 World Cup, introduced under 17, so that football can grow. Now you're telling me that we are going to have a, um, a, a Bayana World Cup and Africa is going to have 13 representatives. How are you going to grow football in Malawi? How are you going to grow football in, in, in Uganda? Would they ever qualify? The Nations Cup is, is a competition that's that they go cannot, to. Cannot, cannot, that's the um, point. Um, see, that's see the when, point. When, I, when, I saw, when I saw the whole CAF Congress, it was, it was, it was, it was a, a sham. I was not really happy. <laughs> really? Cannot, cannot, just, hold, just, hold, just, hold your, just hold your thoughts right there. I'll come back to you. I understand where you're coming from. We'll get our conversation going in sports tonight on channels television. Let's go on this quick break. It's getting eaten right here, so don't go anywhere. Stay. Welcome back to tonight on your award-winning sports-loving channels, television. The conversation was just getting interesting just before we got into that break, talking about FIFA's plan to have the World Cup every two years. Ikena uh, is in the Lagos studio, and Ikena has been, you know, talking about uh, what is the need for Africa, and that's what we've been trying to understand also. So let, let's hear from you tonight. Talk to our sports tonight at channelstv.com. Ikena, let me get you to complete, you know, what you were talking about. So for Uganda, Malawi, for instance, don't you think they'll be welcoming this idea of having a World Cup every two years? Because now, they can believe that they might just qualify for the World Cup someday. We need to pay attention to, to the fine details, what is actually happening. There are people FIFA needs to be at the World Cup. There are countries they need that, to be at the World Cup. The North African countries, probably Nigeria, probably South Africa, and one other team. See, the way they are building this thing, you have heard, you've heard what, what they are talking about, the, the Super League. Morocco wants three teams. Egypt wants three, South Africa wants three. How are they going to get the 20 days that will play the Super League? They have not explained everything in detail. They're just manipulating us and pushing us around. You know, I, I said something. Sometimes you, you, you sit back and, and, and you, 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 you always remember that saying, be careful what you wish for. We, we did everything possible mm. to kick out Issa Hayatu. But Hayatu was the one fighting against these things. They, they wanted the, the Nations Cup to be four years. He refused. They wanted the Nations Cup to, uh, they wanted it to be, to, to be held in June. But not considering the weather conditions in Africa, Hayatu refused. And they decided to, you know, with everything, then we, the, the fans, we were saying that he has stayed for so long that he should leave. He left. They brought Ahmed Ahmed, a puppet. He didn't perform. They kicked him out. They brought him Mosepe. And look at what is happening. It is, as an African, I, I hold the Nations Cup dear to my heart. It is not palatable. It is not, it's not what you want to see. You want to see an explanation of how the progress is going to be made. How are we going to get these 13 teams? What happens to the, our beloved Nations Cup? Very, very, just, just pay attention. Just, just hear me out in, in the next one minute. They already, the, the clubs in, 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 in Europe are already meeting with, they're, they're going to have a meeting with FIFA probably next week. So that because of this Omicron um, virus that they just, just discovered, they, 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 they really want FIFA to stop African players from coming to the Nations, Nations Cup in, 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 in Cameroon. They are, not, they are doing everything possible to hinder our progress in football, which as a fan, it's not palatable to me. That's that's my this is so they should come out and explain to us. They're just you know making this, making um, uh, decisions and making presentations. They have not told us in details what is actu Africa's actual benefit in this biennial World Cup. Wow, wow. Put that out themselves. <laughs> yeah, yeah, me. You are closer to him can, uh, uh You need to tell him to calm down. Probably give him give him a go. <laughs> nah, so what? Uh, Africa will be fine. Yeah, I was enjoying everything he was saying, and um, I guess uh, sometimes we enjoy the opportunity to just sit back and listen to other people. Uh, let's get uh, another perspective to all of this as we're talking about. Alfred Okolikwe joins us now. Alfred has been listening in and uh, obviously heard what Ikena has said. So, greetings to you, Alfred. Thanks for joining us on the show. Uh, this matter, it will take a, a, a long time before it gets resolved. But the question always is, now that... Uh, Montigliani and all the other guys, they are looking for a soft landing, they are looking for a way in between. Do you think when they have that meeting on December 20, everybody can agree to this biennial World Cup? Um, good evening, Yemi. Um, of course, you can, uh, Austin and the rest of the guys, um, thank you for uh, the opportunity once again. Um, this issue will not go away. Uh, I mean, it's... Um, because um, the preliminary consultation has been done, FIFA know where their power base. 
sort of when it comes to the numbers, um, you don't know where they lie. Um, you get the Africans. Africa has over 52 or there are about votes, you know, affiliate members. That's what it's all about. It's about the numbers. And FIFA knows all of this. And of course, that of four years, having people on the outside, look, football, in the football business, there are people who are the key guys who play on the inside. And there are people who play on the fringes. I mean, the guys who play on the fringes want to be in, inside. They want to be part of it. Um, if you, you mentioned the example of, um, say, a certain Malawi, or Tanzania, for example, they know that as presently constituted, it will take something out of this world um, to get them to play at the World Cup. It will take a Togo to happen for them to, to be at the World Cup. And so they know that their best bet is to align with FIFA. And FIFA knows, understands all of this. Uh, it's not a debate that will go often, um, okay. that, that will go easily. I mean, and the guys in Europe know I, all, this, this, all of this is about protecting your market. And the Europe knows that they control, when it comes to the money, the big competitions and the money, the um, television, the, the numbers, when it comes yeah. to the stats, you know, raking in the money, they know. And anything that will upset that will kind of, they will fight okay. to ensure that it doesn't happen. And that's where we are presently. And okay. it is, um, have you understand all of this? That's why it's just playing up the... The thing about having to wait four years cycle is not good enough for some certain countries. Every country wants to play the World Cup, which, which is of a truth. Everybody wants to play the World Cup, including the San Marinos of this world and, um, and of course, uh, some okay. of these countries uh, in Europe that make up the number. Um, so it's not an argument that will go easily. It's something that we'll continue to talk about. And FIFA understands the politics of this, I'm sure that at the end of the day, not everybody will come out smiling from that meeting if it, right. if it does happen. Yeah, the thing is going to happen. It's a global summit, December 20. We'll keep our fingers crossed and see what happens. We're pressed for time, guys. Let's just quickly go into CAF Club uh, competitions so that we can have a spread uh, and talk about it. Then before we go back to Austin stuff and talk about uh, the first uh, press conference for Ralph Rangnick. But first, let's talk about the Confederations Cup. It's going to come up on your screen. Rivers United walking on tight rope. It's like thin ice. Um, you know, it's... They're, they're going to be playing against our master. They have a 2-1 lead. It's too nice. It could crack. Aimba and uh, Al Etihad uh, of Libya. Uh, it's going to be a one-off. Uh, no, no, I think... That, no, no, no. Okay, it's, it's, they're going yeah. you know, to play, play but, second but, leg. But the second was leg, disrupted. Yeah, the first leg yeah. will not become the second leg. Mm -hmm. So, we'll we see what happens now. Alfred, let me get your thoughts quickly uh, on, on this one. A quick one so that we can cover all grounds. Uh, I think Rivers United are working on thin ice. I don't know what you think. Um, deja vu. We've seen this happen before. Remember when, when um, FC Fan had a crack on the, at the continent? It was at the same Al Masri, and they had a one goal advantage. It was easily cancelled when they went back to Alexandria. And it, we've seen it happen before. We play against non-African opposition at the national at the national team level. Somehow we'll find a way of deconstructing them, but at the at the club level, it, they become somewhat of an Achilles heel. And for Rivers United, they raised an alarm earlier on, um, talking about all of the things that that are, for me, outside of the field of play. Those are not really the real issue. The real issue, for me, is when you get to the field. It is 11 against 11. You play your game. Um, I, I know they have their work cut out. They, they had chances in the first leg that they didn't bury. So it will be... Um, it will be to the advantage. Get an away goal. It will speak well for them if they can be able to score. If they score, they will kind of unsettle the Egyptians. But we've seen things like this happen before. And it's it's not looking good. Um, the last time, last season, when Enyba got to the group stage of the continent, um, it was uh, it, two, the, the two Nigerian teams playing. So this time around, we have to play different oppositions. And... Uh, it's not looking good for Rivers United, but I'll be shocked if they get the result. I wish them the very best, and I hope they get it. All right, quick one on Aimba. For, for, for Aimba International, they have it all to do. The advantage that they thought they had, this um, the traveling fiasco now is giving the advantage to Libya. The Libyan team came into town. Guess what? On the private jet. And they just, all of the issues that we play off. All of the things that we play up when we travel, just in our face, they came in the uh, it's Libya, they came on the private jet, 
and they will play Egypt back. The advantage that Egypt at all they had, that has been cancelled because when they play, they have to go play the second leg. It means that they have to get their act right, get the win. But if you're looking for a Nigerian team to get the result, it is Egypt International. Now the advantage of playing home in the reverse fixture, now that has been cancelled out because the first leg will be in Nigeria. And, you know, when a team needs the result, or fortunately for them, the reverse fixture will not be played in Libya. And so... Um, it's an opportunity for them to still right. hold their own here and go there and get the result that they need to play in the group stage of the competition. Okay, all right. Uh, Ikena, quick one. Your, yeah, I, I what do you think is going to happen? It's, it's um, difficult to call him because we've only seen Nyumba play the first round. Because of the league is not, it's not on at this moment. So you can't really feel the team that is going to play. But they are, they are veterans in the, on the continent, so they should be able to scare this. And like Afre said, the advantage they have is that um, Ali Tihad is not going to play in Libya. So he's going to be away, either in Morocco or, or Tunisia. So just get the job done in your first leg. Get as many goals as possible. When you get the second leg, you can manage the game. But as for Rivers United, I don't see them getting a win over al Masri. Let, let them surprise me. Wow. Okay. This Nigerian team. We get the job done, yeah. I mean, because now with, with African football and Nigerian team, just I just wait, you know, for the result. So hopefully Aiba and Rivers United will will do what they need to do. Rivers Rivers United, time and time again, when we expect them to get the results, they don't, you know, and now they're in a very tight corner. Uh, let's wait and see uh, what football can offer. Uh, when they play that second leg against Almazri. For Aimba, I, I just I just hope that they will learn from these other guys who come to the country to play football because as Aimba at this level is supposed to be a world-class football team. You know, when you see how some of these guys prepare to come into the country, you wonder what have we been doing, what have we been doing with our successes that have recorded over the years uh, with our football. So all the best to Aimba and um, Rivers United. Let's bring it to England right here. Um, so much talks as regards Ralph Rangnick after that press conference. You know, what, what style is he bringing to Manchester United? What can he do to ensure that, you know, the team gets winning again? Uh, good thing is Michael Carrick has done a good job and has landed the baton to him on a winning note against a decent Arsenal team. Uh, Manchester United will play Crystal Palace on Sunday at Old Trafford. So, uh, he's got a big job to do because if you look at Crystal Palace this season, yeah, I mean, they've been very decent on the... Patrick Vieira, and um, anybody who is thinking that, oh, it's going to be easy for them, they're just going to push Crystal Palace um, away, you're wrong. Manchester United, they've lost five games this season. Crystal Palace, they've lost just two games this season. Just four games this season. So, uh, but for the draws that they've had, that's why they sit at 11 on the log, while Manchester United uh, is seventh on the log. I mean, let's listen to Ralph Rangnick at the presser today. And then when we come back, okay, let me let's run through this, then we'll go listen to Ralph Rangnick, Manchester City. Uh, we'll go to Vicarage Road to play. And this is a for team, a team that I think have, have, have been showing good form lately. Shout out to Nigeria's Emmanuel Dennis, who has scored six goals so far this season. United will host Brentford. As we said, Manchester United will take on Crystal Palace while top now we hope to keep their winning form going when they host Norwich City. And then Aston Villa will take on Leicester City. Steven Gerrard, by the way, enjoying a good start with Aston Villa and has been nominated for the Manager of the Month Award. Let's listen to Ralph Rangnick now. Uh, he's been talking about his plans to come stabilise things at Manchester United. I've not been so good at all. I mean, obviously, I've watched uh, the latest games. I watched not only last night's game, but also the games against the Watford and against Chelsea. And uh, on TV, when I didn't know that there would, would be contact in, in the next days, I also watched out of interest the games against Liverpool and against Man Manchester City. Uh, so I'm pretty well aware and acquainted with uh, what's happening here in the club and in the Premiership. Um, and. Uh, yeah, I think it's pretty obvious uh, that uh, the team they, the team have abundant talent, young talented players, but also ex enough experienced players in the squad. But um, I mean, the major the major target for me in the next couple of weeks, days, weeks is just to to bring more balance into the team. Um, 
Even yesterday, we conceded two goals. We needed three goals in the end to win the game. And if you look at, look at the total goals, the number of goals conceded, it's almost two, two on average per game, and this is just too much. So this is my approach uh, to help the team to get more balance, to get more control on the game. And yesterday's game, I mean, it was, it was exciting for the fans, but even for myself as the future coach, those are not the kind of games that you need every day because uh, um, in football, for me, it's, it's to, to minimize the uh, coincidence fact factor and uh, to have control and gain control on the game. And this is uh, in football what it's about. And this is my approach. I will try to help these outstanding, talented players to to try and get and keep the way away from their own goal. Now, don't be quick to say talk is cheap. Let's wait to see what he's going to do. He hopes to bring balance to the Manchester United squad. And of course, you know, get the team, you know, uh, winning mentality going. And, and yeah, me, I, you know, I, I love the fact that he's composed as a matured football manager. And maybe he might just turn out to be the right man, you know, to, to bring some Calm to Manchester United. <laughs> I, I think so. Uh, a lot of the fans will be happy. I mean, when if if comments are anything to go by, that, that's why I agree with you. Uh, don't don't rush to say talk is ch cheap. Uh, just I mean, if talks, yeah. if comments are anything to go by, United fans have missed having a manager that speaks this way. That even the way he speaks shows mm -hmm. you their approach that he wants to take uh, to the game. Uh, be because we're pressed for time, uh, le let me just let Alfred and Ikena say 18 or two, then we'll, we'll try to wrap things up on the show. Uh, let me go to Alfred quickly. That was, his, that was Ralph Ragnick's first press conference. What was your takeaway? For me, it strikes me as a confident manager who knows what he wants, but, but I don't know uh, what struck you uh, listening to him. Well, um, if I'm a player of Manchester United and a manager comes and um, gives you that assurance first that, um, of course, the team is, um, is um, filled with talent, both young and experienced players, and he wants to bring a bit of stability. As a player, I'll, I'll kind of warm myself to, to him. That's what you need at this point, because at every point, the players get the stick. Each time the results don't go their way. Yes, you can always blame the manager, and the manager... Um, get tossed each time uh, the results don't go their way. But the players ultimately know that somehow they need the direction of the pitch for them to get the ultimate result. And if Ragnick will bring that, I think uh, for Manchester United, it will be it will be a good one for them. It, it comes across as somebody that, like he said, knows what he's doing, um, knows, has his own uh, thinking about the game, how it has to be played and how to get the results. And, you know, coming into Manchester United, hopefully we'll bring something new. Um, the opponents will not like the sound of his voice, uh, but there's something about the premiership. When you come, you go learn. You go learn. I believe you will learn because uh, <laughs> there are some tested coaches, tested players that want to just give him one for the road. You go learn. Even to go, had to learn at some point uh, before he got that um, Chelsea team um, and played. Yeah. So, um, we will learn and then... Um, Somehow, by the time he gets one or two beating, he will understand his way around. <laughs> okay, all right. I, I, I mean, I was caught there yeah, with I, that local balance. Yeah. He go left. Alan, but your thoughts? I, I think I think he is different from the coaches you've always, we've always been accustomed to, or we've always seen. I'll tell you what. Raf Ragnik builds teams. He doesn't just coach them. He builds them. He builds Hoffenheim. Mm -hmm. He did the same thing with Shaka Ofo, which which um, did not really outlive his legacy, but he did put them up. He, 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 um, he was called in to build RB Leipzig. Leipzig. And he was on the verge of signing for AC Milan before um, Pioli took over. And what they were calling him to AC Milan to do was set up the team and be in charge from the operational side of the things. Uh, of things. That means that the, the likes of Mardini would have resigned and they were re ready to resign to get a similar to where it was. But of, of, fortunately, or fortunately for everybody, purely did a good work or, or still did okay. a good work. So coming to, to coming to Manchester United, he's not coming to coach them as a team. He's coming right. to build All right. a legacy okay. that will last into the future. All so right. that, that, is, that is the difference. And he's, he's been, uh, um, okay. he has a master plan for the Ganga Bresen, which Klopp and Tuchel all you uh, so uh, that he copied yeah okay all right let's uh, let's also listen to the man again he, he says look 
Uh, the Manchester United job is just too, too good to turn down. And of course, he couldn't turn it down uh, when he was offered the job. Let's listen to Ralph Ragnick uh, talking about how excited he is to be the interim manager of Manchester United. I mean, at the time when, when Chelsea contact, contacted me uh, uh, last year or this year in, in February, we, they only spoke about uh, the option to become interim manager for four months. So it was in February uh, without any perspective to, to work uh, in the long term together. And here now we are talking about six and a half months. So we only have one third of all the games played in the Premiership. And uh, as you all know, we have also agreed upon a, a two year uh, advisory role after those six and a half months. And, uh, yeah, and, and in the end, to be honest, if a club like Manchester United contacts you um, for such a role, you cannot possibly turn it down. All right. Uh, if a club like United contacts you, you possibly uh, can uh, turn it down. Uh, I mean, we, we still have to go back. We still have to go back to Austin uh, because this is tough, and uh, the fans here uh, uh, are excited. Uh, I, I don't know if the same feeling, if it's the same feeling uh, with the guys over there, because the man inspires confidence. He can just reel that some of the things he's achieved and he's highly regarded in coaching circles. Um, so I, I don't know. Let, let me just throw that onto Austin. You know. As, as we, you know, before we leave this, uh, so Austin, your, your thoughts on that, the fans in the United yeah. Kingdom, are, are they excited as some of the fans in the other parts of the world are with this appointment? It's mixed feelings, you know, right here in, in England, particularly, you know, I've been monitoring the media and um, some of the fans that they're either here or there. I was at Stamford Bridge to see Chelsea take on Manchester United. And after that match, uh, I spoke to a lot of Manchester United fans. And look, the truth is, they, they, they hate the fact that they started the season this way. Like Manchester United struggling with just before that match, they were back 10th on the log, you know? And so they already lost, you know, belief in the team to take on Manchester, to take on us now. Yeah, so what, what Ralph Rangnick we need to do, uh, and he said it, I need to give control back to the team. I think when they get that control, and they start winning, you know, fans, you know, they, they follow you only when you win. So they need to start winning again. But what I want to see with Ralph, he cannot mention, oh, it, it boosts teams. Those teams you mentioned, none is as big as Manchester United. Ego problem will pop up. I want to see how he's going to handle it. You know, when Manchester United is facing a difficult game and you take off Cristiano Ronaldo or a Pogba is not happy, something, I want to see how he's going to do that. Ultimately, I mean, the fans are saying his biggest job in this interim role is to get a proper manager. I think that's the major work because now you're interim. When you're done, who will you say, okay, come and take over? That's his main work, I mean. All right. Uh, that's a good place to, to leave it, Austin. And uh, the man says, look, I'm here for a few months. I, I may be asked to stay on. If you ask me, I will. But we'll see. Uh, interesting days ahead. All right, um, yeah. it's time to wrap things up on the show. But first, I need to thank the guys. Let me start with Alfred Okoli. We Alfred, I want to thank you for your time on the show today. It was always fun having you with us on the show. Um, Swan, we kicked off today. And you have to truly scored two goals in the opening game. Two goals. A break. I'm ready so to come to brag on national TV. Really? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, it's, 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 it's good to hear. It's good to hear. Thank you once again, Alfred. We'll do this again uh, some other time. And uh, also, <laughs> and also, uh, Iken, uh, okay, Chiku, I do. Uh, Iken, okay, Chiku, I also want to thank you, thank you uh, for much. your time uh, on the show. Always good having you with us. It's good to be back. Really, really good to be back. Okay. <laughs> All right. That's the show for today. We do hope that you've enjoyed everything that we've done uh, today. We're back again uh, next week uh, to do what we love doing best, which is taking you on a trip across the money-spinning world of sports. From the city of Lagos, right here in Nigeria, I'm Yemi Adebayo. Bye-bye now. Yeah, me, Alfred, there to wait for me to leave Lagos to score two goals at the Swan Cup. It's okay. We will investigate that match for match fixing in London. Yeah, I'm Austin Okuna.